potentially a variation or a modification of the mechanical properties. Um, so. Now, main alloying elements of plain carbon steel or structural steel is, is, is uh, carbon and manganese. Okay, you sort of tend to get uh, some residuals as well, but you know they're just part of the, the steel making process. Uh, they don't really have too much of an influence uh, unless of course they're in very high levels. So what tends to happen with um, steels, they're uh, essentially a perlite and ferrite phase microstructure. And once you start getting to temperatures in excess of 650 degrees, the structure starts to modify where the perlite phase will spherilize. Uh, and it just goes from being a nice lamella structure to little, little spheroids. And that then tells you that it's been exposed to pretty high temperatures and at a considerable period of time. And the way we identify that is obviously if we have a sample, uh, we then prepare that sample, we polish it, we etch it, and we look at it under the, under the optical microscope in the laboratory. Um, but there are also techniques available to do that analysis or that review uh, in situ and that's called uh, metallographic replication. So if components, and I'm assuming there's access to the component, but they can't be removed from site or whatever the case may be, uh, the surface can be etched, prepped and etched on, surface, on, on site and then viewed with a portable, little portable microscope and we use a polymer compound called microset or an acetate film, which replicates the surface. So that then allows us to uh, do some more detailed review on those on those replicas uh, back in, in the laboratory. And that's, and that's a common practice used in power stations and things like that when they want to assess the condition of, of, of vessels and boilers. But it has also, we've also used it on a, on a number of occasions when we've had to look at uh, fire damaged uh, structural components or, or other assets to assess whether it's still fit for purpose. Now, on the other hand, alloy steels, they're, they're a little bit different. Um, so they'll have an alloying addition uh, to the, the, the steel, in addition to carbon and manganese, there'll be chromium, manganese, uh, sorry, molybdenum, nickel, moly, um, and, they're, and they're sort of at various levels and various levels then dictate what sort of properties you tend to have. Now, the more common ones are your hardenable, quench and tempered steels, uh, and stainless steels. However, these steels, if they're, if they're then exposed to high temperatures, say in the vicinity of, uh, depending on the hardness of quenching tempered steels could be anything above 200 degrees, it can then modify the material properties whereby you get a reduction in, in hardness. Uh, that's for your quenching tempered steels. With, um, uh, with stainless steels, and depending on the grade of stainless steel, you will then get uh, precipitation of different phases, right? So knowing uh, that, that the sort of features that one can expect, um, it's quite easy again to use metallography or in fact, uh, to be able to uh, do some hardness tests in situ, which we, you can do with a, a portable hardness tester, or of course, uh, even evaluating the mechanical properties where samples are taken and uh, the tensile strength, for instance, uh, is, is, is measured in, in the laboratory. So that then again tells you that a modification has been, has occurred, it's been exposed to high temperature, and we can sort of get a fair idea of what temperatures we're talking about uh, that those, those steels have been exposed to. So I guess for the, for the fire investigate, investigator, uh, the metallurgical services, um, in addition to looking at um, I guess microstructural features and, and mechanical properties. There's also the mechanical condition of components, right? Our, our view when we're doing a failure investigation, for instance, uh, every broken bit counts. Um, you'd be amazed uh, as to uh, when you're looking at ancillary equipment uh, adjacent to the actual failure or the incident, just what sort of information can be, can be gathered um, to identify what's actually gone wrong. You know, looking at fractography, for instance, where components may fail by fatigue and then subsequently causing something else to let go, which then causes a fire. Uh, so that may have been the ignition source. Uh, the root cause was something failing uh, 
prior to that. And, and, and we've seen it a number of times with, um, with fasteners and bolts, for instance, where they've, um, uh, where they've failed by fatigue, something's let go, um, lubricants sprayed onto an engine bay or, or a hot surface, and there's been an ignition. Um, so as I said, microstructure and, and mechanical properties, hardness and tensile strength. And then of course, there's the uh, scanning electron microscopy and, and, and EDS. They're, um, they're, they're very sort of key tools that we use to assist with fractography, uh, mapping and, and elemental analysis. And, you know, for example, this is an, uh, a, a component that we looked at that was exposed to high temperature. And, and this is the elemental mapping where you can sort of see there oxygen rich, so that's telling us it's a, it's a uh, high temperature oxide scale. There's a bit of depletion of chromium. Uh, so there's chromium there and the depletion of chromium just beside that. So um, mapping uh, gives us an idea of what, what's happening with regards to um, changes to the microstructure where, where, where precipitation is occurring. And again, helps us with uh, identifying, I guess, what sort of temperatures uh, a particular component may have been exposed to. Oops. Was I on the right way? Sorry, Steph, apologies. So, but in addition to metallurgy, you know, we're, we're most of the team here are metallurgists, but we've also got our, our material scientists. So it's, it extends beyond metallurgy where, you know, the material scientists will use some of, you know, the analytical techniques that I've spoken about uh, and apply those to things like polymers, fabrics, lubricants, residue, um, ceramics, and a lot of techniques that we uh, use quite extensively is in FTIR um, and, and TGA, uh, where you know samples of polymers, for instance, uh, can be analyzed comparing areas of, of heat effect and non-heat effect, looking for you know, changes like oxidation uh, in, the, um, uh, in the spectra that it, that it, um, that, uh, it uh, gives us. And, and of course, you know, something has already been exposed to heat, all of a sudden, you know, its thermal stability is, is compromised and that can be identified when, when using a TGA, for instance. Um, they're um, pretty um, high-end, expensive analytical kit. Um, we don't have those in-house, but we, we, we work very closely with the, uh, the university to, um, to uh, do that work for us. And then once we get the... Uh, the, the uh, information back, we then interpret that information to try and identify what's, what's, what's happened. Okay, so, service, I think, case studies. Oh, sorry, that, that shouldn't have been the other one. That's double one. Anyway, so I'll, I'll go through some, some case studies, for instance. Um, and I've tried to sort of um, align the case studies that we've done that are associated with uh, with fires and fire damage. Uh, look, we're no fire investigators by any stretch of the imagination. We we're uh, you know metallurgists and, and materials engineers, um, and what we tend to do is just report on our findings and then give that information to you know um, whether it's the OEM, the, the end user, or whether it's uh, people that are you know um, experienced in, in fire investigations to assess that information and and come up with um, with uh, I guess likely root causes now this particular just a question there roger i mean what what how many would you do like how often do you do actually uh, get involved with a, a fire investigator or fire investigation um, um, look I, I would imagine i would say we get probably um fire investigations not many maybe half a dozen a year okay that's all and that's uh, over look, your whole company your whole team or just oh, yourself? This, this team here in newcastle uh, oh, okay you know, team in newcastle i mean our 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 bread and butter, our main uh, mark line of work is looking at doing failure investigations, but mechanical failures. So whether right. it's uh, overload, fatigue, corrosion, things yep. like that. But I guess because we're so uh, well entrenched in the the mining industry, for instance, when yep. an investigation that in the fire comes up, they, they ask us. And it was for, and actually it was quite, quite fortuitous that um, Sonia did get in touch with us because we weren't aware of the the uh, the company there on the Central Coast, which was now it's good to know because we, there are sometimes uh, investigations that we do get asked to to undertake, which we think, look, no, it's not our area of expertise, and we just sort of let that one 
let that one go. So now we know who to, who to redirect it to. And the failures that you're saying uh, in the metal that you're most of the work that you do is that around the mining industry, or would you look at things? Do, does do police ever come to you with like something that's happened that's killed someone? Or um, oh, and- we've had a we've had a, we've had we've had a few cases like that in litigation and stuff like that, legal yeah. cases. But but generally, um, mining, heavy industry, power and process, manufacturing, the you know, heavy industry gets us involved. Okay. Um, to, to, to do the failure investigation work that we do. And that's because our workshop is has the capability to handle big stuff. So we can process equipment, failed equipment in there that just, which weighs a few tonne in size. Ah, oh, okay. Um, so that's why they sort of get us involved. But we also look at very small things and very small, you know, uh, electrical fires we've been involved in. I know that we sort of helped Sonia uh, along the lines in an investigation of that nature. So. Okay. Yeah, fire Thanks. investigations, not our, not our key market, but we do get involved. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this one here, for instance, um, um, we looked at a, um, uh, a train, a double-decker train, or sorry, wagon, sorry, that um, basically was caught in a fire. And they, um, they wanted us to assess whether that particular component or that particular structure was fit for service. So they identified about 20 locations for us to look at, and we and we did the metallographic replication uh, technique, and identified that in some areas, and I think they're in the photos here, there were some areas where you saw some, you know, carbide precipitation, uh, and in other areas there wasn't. So when they are, we we were sort of tasked with assessing whether it was fit for purpose, and from our perspective, uh, the uh, the carbide precipitation wasn't going to affect the the corrosion performance of the uh, of the um, the rail car, um, but potentially it could have an influence on the mechanical properties of that of that structure, namely the the impact strength property. So there was a bit more work to be done uh, by the um, the owner of that asset to um, to assess its fitness for purpose. This is a um, an example where um, we had a uh, a client. Um, submit to us some uh, some lagging uh, that had been fitted to the exhaust manifold of a hydraulic excavator engine and um, the uh, there was a fire uh, and which the lagging is there to stop the fire uh, but there was a fire and once they uh, had extinguished that fire uh, they identified um, some substances caught uh, in the uh, in the fibers of that lagging so they sent it to us and um, we did the analysis, uh, namely looking at the uh, doing some FTIR, and from the FTIR, what we were able to uh, sort of come to the conclusion was that yes, they were similar, but uh, given the presence of some of the um, those peaks and those uh, uh, compounds that we identified, uh, the most likely source well, was a synthetic rubber. Now, um, where that may, may have come from, then. The, the site uh, has that information. They then go away and do their RCA uh, to identify what, where could that uh, rubber uh, have come from? Uh, you know, was it a contaminant? Was it a seal? Um, uh, some of that information we then are privy to. We just identify um, what we think um, uh, the source is, and then they go away and try and identify why that source, that ignition source, was where it was. Uh, this is an example where um, there wasn't a lot of metallurgy undertaken, uh, but it was a one of those um, investigations where it was about sort of thinking outside the box uh, to identify um, what potentially could have caused the fire uh, on this um, particular uh, haul truck. Uh, you can sort of see there the, um, the smouldering uh, truck in the pit on fire. Uh, that's basically some of the... Uh, uh, the result from the fire. Um, now, when uh, we got involved, obviously it was a case of, of trying also getting some some uh, information on you know the, the sequence of events leading up to that failure. So um, basically, we were then, we were told yes, there was a uh, a failure of a hose and it sprayed lubricant on the engine bay, resulting in a an ignition. Now, what was interesting <clears throat> was that 
you know, the hardware was installed um, on the 23rd and on the 25th, you know, a few shifts later, um, this thing failed. So I guess for our, from our perspective, it, it was a case of, well, you know, why would something like that fail so, so quickly? Uh, there wasn't any, um, any recordings of you know, pressure spikes or anything like that. So this is a case of sort of, um, in addition to doing the analysis that we did down the track, it was also about gathering evidence and, and doing, in fact, some, some additional, I guess, um, uh, tests or, uh, or uh, simulator tests uh, in, the, in the laboratory. Um, Uh, you sort of see here, um, that's the failed hose. I sort of tried to outline it uh, in red. Okay, and that's the fitting, which is on down the bottom. So the hose is up there, fitting's down there. So it's come away. Now, when we uh, uh, were engaged, we said, look, send us the, uh, the failed connection, which they did. Obviously, this is the hose, which is that one there. And that's the fitting, which is that down there. And we also asked them to send us a new hose. Uh, so we can just do a comparison of, uh, of uh, certain properties and tests. Now, what we did was um, the new hose, we, we x-rayed it. And, and that's another thing that I probably haven't touched on at the beginning of the uh, presentation is in addition to the metallurgy, there's also a lot of MDT, non-destructive techniques that can be used to, um, to, to assist a, a fire investigation. And this is one of them where we used uh, x-ray, we x-rayed both ends. And what it showed was that one end of the, of the new hose had only been partially inserted into the fitting, uh, exposing the last two crimped barbs, while the other end was okay. So it, it immediately it rang um, alarm bells uh, because you could see here that um, it sort of falls a bit short, that's the hose, falls a bit short, whereas this one here goes right to the end. Um, and we thought, well, geez, what's the, what's the likelihood of getting a, a new hose that has uh, this anomaly in it? I mean, so we uh, did some pressure testing and um, identified that uh, the, uh, the proof pressure specified uh, was uh, um, a little bit uh, on the low side. Okay. Where um, we've got 43 megapascals or 6,400 psi as opposed to 69. So uh, its rating was not as it should have been. And when we looked at when we looked at the the lab burst hose and the, and the site burst hose, uh, they were very similar uh, in, in appearance. So our conclusion really came down to a, a, a procedural process where um, the, I guess the, um, the contractor assigned to, to fit hoses and, and, and look after the, the, um, the hydraulics, um, or the, sorry, the, um, the lubrication uh, of, the, of the fleet of, uh, of um, trucks basically um, had a problem with their assembly practices. So this basically resulted in um, uh, all the hoses being removed uh, from the fleet of trucks to eliminate you know, a possible occurrence on, a, on another truck of something like this. And uh, they were checked, their practices uh, chain improved, and um, then new hoses reinstalled. Uh, but this, there wasn't a lot of metallurgy or a lot of science or a lot of analytical work. It was really um, just a case of going through a process of information gathering and just uh, doing a bit of uh, fact finding and talking and looking at just, you know, uh, trying to identify why something would fail as opposed to just going through and doing, uh, doing tests to, 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 for information that probably wouldn't have uh, been any use in, that, in, in this particular instance. Um, this case study that we were involved in was a, um, major bushfire investigation. It was a class action. I, I can't sort of say too much, but um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But um, one of our, um, one of our um, principal consultants was involved in, in this work. And um, basically um, it was a major bushfire which, which resulted in a record class action. Now, what the uh, analysis 
were dead. And this is where we sort of sort of what I've been speaking about prior sort of wraps it all up about various analytical techniques where the analysis identified some arcing on the stay wire. So what you've got here, where I've, where I've circled it, you've got a, a stay wire, and that's the uh, that's the conductor conductor wire. Okay, and we identified um, arcing on the stay wire, and you can sort of see there the metallurgical features associated with the uh, uh, the arc on the stay wire and the damage there. All right, and then of course, uh, in addition to the metallography that we did, uh, oh that was undertaken. Uh, we also did some, some mapping work and identified an aluminium particle on the stain wire. Now, an aluminium shouldn't be uh, on, on the stain wire. The only source would be the aluminium conductor. Um, so that is an elemental mapping where you can see uh, the aluminium highlighted in, in red. Okay. Sorry, Roger, I've just missed a question from Grant, but Grant's asking, how was the X-ray image achieved if it had already separated? I think that could be on from a previous... Oh, the, the, uh, sorry, the, the X-ray that we did was actually on the new one. And uh, so we had the separated one as part of the investigation, but we did the X-ray on two ends from the new hose and we identified on the new hose that the uh, fitting was only, wasn't uh, inserted all the way through and encrypt as it should be. So all of a sudden in a new component, we identified a, a quality issue or, or I guess a fitment or, or a uh, procedural issue on how they were actually uh, crimping the, the polymer hose onto the, onto the end fitting. So the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the failed hose was only used to compare its end or its, its separated end with the separated end of the new hose once we did a pressure test. Right, thank you. That's the question. Yeah. I hope so. I think uh, it hasn't responded yet, but yeah, keep okay. moving on. Thanks, Roger. Right. That's right. So, um, so yeah, we found this massive aluminium particle on the on the, uh, on the aluminium conductor. Uh, we then look at um, some other features. Now, when the um, when this occurred, the, there was a lot of reports uh, that there were fires and along fence lines. And uh, you can sort of see uh, the arc marks uh, along the aluminium conductor, which was uh, retrieved from near a fence. Now, when uh, they did some, uh, we did some analytical work, some high radio density measurements and some uh, EDS work, uh, iron and that should be, sorry, that should be zinc, not zoin. Um, so iron and zinc uh, was identified on the conductor and, um, being an aluminium conductor, the only likely source where you're going to have uh, zinc and iron uh, caught onto that conductor when it's arcing is as a galvanized fence. And when um, some of this high radio density measurement work was done, it confirmed an exogenous material. So you can sort of see here, uh, there, and also there, the different, um, different, uh, well, this is right, that's why that's high density material. Uh, and that compared, and in addition to the, um, SEM EDS work basically uh, confirm the findings that we put forward. Um, so this is something that I sort of tend to throw out um, to, to a lot of clients when I give presentations. You know, it's similar to uh, if anyone remembers the, um, uh, the Bush administration uh, and. There was a guy there that talked about known knowns and known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. Um, what was his name? Um, excuse me. Rumsfeld. That's it, Rumsfeld. Yeah, Donald. <laughs> yeah, he gave that speech and everyone was just scratching their head. And I think, what's this guy talking about? And it's similar along, similar to the lines of that statement where the only one, only one thing is worse than knowing you have a crack growing in a component, and that is not knowing you have a crack growing in a component. So... You know, the push for you know, asset integrity, asset management, asset reliability is something that we, uh, we, uh, we advocate quite strongly. Um, so, and this is the Moomba, the Sydney gas pipeline explosion. Um, happened in 1982. We, uh, we were involved in that, well, I wasn't. Um, I think I was still in uh, high school, but uh, the company 
uh, CCI Pope or CW Pope at the time, before they were um, acquired by Bureau Veritas, was involved, and that's the aerial view uh, of a failure site. Uh, I think it, uh, pieces were found, I don't know how many kilometres away from the actual explosion site. Uh, that's one of the pieces that were thrown. And the cause of the failure really was you know, stress corrosion cracking, which um, some of these pipelines are uh, uh, susceptible to and still are, and we still get involved in doing a condition assessment on, uh, on, on the pipelines to see if, what the level of stress corrosion cracking is like and whether they need to be sleeved or, or replaced. Um, and this obviously, at the time, uh, being the main line gas line into uh, in the city would have caused uh, a uh, major disruption. Um, and that's uh, that's the end of my uh, my, my talk. I hope uh, you found it interesting. And uh, yeah, look, if you've got any questions, by all means, uh, ask away. Yeah, thanks, Roger. That's great. Uh, if there are any questions, you can unmute yourself, or if you want to type uh, into the message chat uh i guess my question i mean do you use i mean have you exclusively used just private or do you do public agency ever come to you to um look at something in in the metal sphere yeah yeah we, we get all sorts of uh look we get inquiries from you know major oems multinationals legal mums and dads you know i mean i had a lady come to us about a failed dining chair oh you know? Things okay. like, that. <laughs> yeah. right. you know, uh, and so it's we look at yeah all sorts of things. Um, yeah. and, and the other question I said I was going to ask was, um, have you ever been to court like to defend or to yeah. explain yeah. your position? Yeah, yeah, yeah. As I haven't been for a while now. Right. Um, I sort of let the others do that. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we get involved. I mean, obviously, you know, you you, like, you prefer it if it gets settled. Uh, yes. rather than we all <laughs> uh, rather but yeah a lot of our um a lot of our metallurgists or our um, consultants have been to to court to um and they've, so they've produced reports as expert witnesses um and then gone to court to you know answer questions defend findings all that sort of stuff yeah right and i guess my question the, the most common thing i see as a fire investigator is uh, electrical items, say power boards or um, plugs or something failing. Now, I always get asked, you know, did did the fire cause the arc or did the arc cause the fire? Now, if you were to be given a piece of copper or, it, or brass from a, a, um, a power board, would you be able to distinguish the difference? Oh, look, sometimes you can and sometimes you can't. That's the right. Best look, I, I sort of... I, I I purposely just touched on alloys and steels and stuff like that because it's 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 easier to explain. I mean, but the non-ferrous components, whether it's brasses, bronze, aluminiums, similar similar philosophy in that they will undergo changes in in microstructural features and properties. They're more complicated though. Uh, well, they're, they're more complicated than your than your standard steels, uh, but. It's the same sort of process, looking at how the copper has melted, uh, what sort of uh, uh, non-metallics or oxidation has occurred. Um, so yes, there are times, and look, we've looked at you know bus bars, uh, we've looked at you know um, motors, and there's been cases where we've been very successful, and, and other cases where we just cannot, uh, we can't give them a, a definitive answer because of the extent of damage. I mean, um, you know, electrical fires compared to some of the ones, the examples that I've, I've set for obviously the, the last one, you know, you're talking some pretty high temperatures mm. uh, and you're talking uh, uh, alloys, or sorry, or you're talking non-ferrous material, which um, it doesn't take too much to melt them, you know. Um, yeah. So, yes, we, 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 we can and we have, but there's also been situations where we haven't been able to identify it. No. Roger. Um just picking up from where Mick came along, um, is it possible if you've got electrical con two copper electrical conductors that you suspect have uh, abraded against each other and arced out, would it be possible to determine that that was in fact the case? Um, I mean, would there be structural differences in... Yeah, look, there would be. I mean, it, it depends also on the copper. I mean, if, 
if the if the copper are slightly different, I mean, I know that you know traditionally you know you've got high purity copper, I would imagine, but in situations where there could be subtle differences in composition, you might be able to pick that. Mm -hmm. uh, if not, it's a case really of then just doing the metallography uh, to see how it's how 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 what the interface looks like between the, the whether where they're fused or where they've arced, and and trying to to pick. I guess um, what's actually happened. Um, mm. Look, it's 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 not as easy with um, the non-ferrous material as it is with with steels, steels and alloys and stainless steels. They're pretty straightforward. Um, when you start talking coppers and what and aluminiums and wires, yeah, it it, it it's a bit. It, it involves a lot more SEM work, mm -hmm. uh, definitely. A lot of a lot of EDS work, but look, you know, it it, it can be done for sure. Yeah. Right, right. All right, thank you. Uh, Roger, uh, Roger, Steve here from uh, Victoria. Hi, Steve. One of, the common in, one of the common indicators that we look for in fire investigation is post-fire oxidisation. Is there anything you could sort of uh, shed with regards to, uh, you, know, you know, traps that we could fall into or anything that we could look for that could definitively lead us to an area of origin? Yes, yeah, Steve, that was what I was going to say that too. Oxidation, you mentioned oxidation. Our oxidation is like um, a direct flame impingement on a metal surfaces and that changes the colour uh, to that sort of orangeness. Uh, what's, I guess, your definition of oxidation? I think that may be what, Steve, it's around the same topic as Steve. Yeah, yeah it's asking me. Yeah. Yes, um, well, right that, well, look, it depends. I mean, say, for instance, I'll give you two examples. If, um, if it's a steel, for instance, um, and it's been exposed to, to the high temperature. The other thing that you sort of tend to tend to have is is, is a process called decarburization, right? I know you call it, whether it's you might refer to it as oxidation, but a steel when it's exposed to uh, very high temperatures, uh, the the surface right adjacent, and I'm only talking you know maybe up to a mil in depth, will lose carbon. Right? It just it it, it oxidizes oxidizer, so to speak, but they call it decarburization. And you'll see distinct uh, change at the surface of the microstructure. Yeah, so that's one way. With, with the non-ferrous, uh, again, it, it, that would require uh, some detailed um, SEM work to see, I guess, what, um, I guess, that's what I'm after. Um, I mean, the, the copper when it when it when, it, when it's at, at temperature, it's also reacting with uh, with with the with, the, with uh, uh, the air, and you sort of tend to get complex, um, uh, I guess, complex um, compounds forming. Not always like a slag and stuff like that. So again, it just it would require uh, if you if you've seen an area and you think, oh, this is the area that I need to concentrate on, having a sample and looking at it under the microscope and the, and the SEM uh, is probably your best bet. Um, steels is pretty easy. As I said, you, you look for things like decarb and just changes the microstructure, the, the, the coppers and the aluminium is a, bit, a little bit more complicated. Yeah. I mean, it sort okay. of comes back to that, to that, the, um, the aluminium, I mean, the aluminium arcing, that was pretty easy, not easy, but it was, it was, the, there, were, there, were, there were telltale signs there, uh, but that was sort of arcing and then it, it stopped. If you've got something that's continually just there, arcing, 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 arcing. I mean, you know, it's um, you've melted it over, um, <laughs> melted. It's, it's been melting and continuing on. Um, it's it, it gets more difficult. Yeah. Okay. And uh, a second question, also, I suppose, is uh, with like switchboard componentry, uh, i.e., buzz bars or copper conductors. Uh, Pre-fire, uh, sometimes when they're overloaded, naturally they're going to start to uh, to heat up. Can you test something for molecular change in the metal to say that the, uh, a buzz bar has been he heated up and cooled down? Uh, probably won't be. You, you probably won't be definitively able to say that it was as a result of an electrical overload. But can you tell that it was be being overheated in its normal operating temperatures? Um, if um, if there's sometimes what you can pick up. Uh, is just very, very uh, localized, like um, uh, where am I? Like, like, like very, very localized melting, right? And you'll see that in a micro. 
Uh, the other the other possibility, of course, is if um, you look at it and it's and it's and you see a buildup of, of of scale or anything like that, high temperature scale, you can take scrapings uh, to do yep. further analysis with um, with an, with the SEM. Uh, but sometimes you sort of sometimes you, you there there will be a precursor until telling you that it's a thing the, the failure is imminent and and normally you sort of just see very very uh, fine I guess a re recrystallization of, of the microstructure right at the surface because it's like a like a like a, maybe melting is, is is the wrong term I think it's more recrystallization you will see it right at the surface then it's it's only it's only it's only very fine. I'm only talking a couple of micron. So you would then have to, I don't know how, how practical it is to be able to get a sample or have a look at that um, under the microscope in the laboratory. Doing replication, for instance, what I spoke about before, wouldn't work. Um, just too fine, too fine. Too fine. And well, I suppose the leading from that, I suppose, I was going to ask uh, post-fire, uh, after a fire's occurred in a switchboard, you, you wouldn't be able to tell because it's naturally uh, all three buzz bars would have potentially been heated by the external uh, exposure. Yeah, that's right. And that, that's what I was saying. Some, it, it gets more difficult uh, because of the, the, the extent of damage, the consequential damage that occurs. Uh, but, but sometimes, you know, we, we, you know you, we have been able to identify uh, what's, what's led to that fire or to that arcing process, yes. You know, um, you know whether something um, has been loose and cause that to, to occur. Um, yes, there's been instances where we've, we've had some success, but again, it's you really it's it's a case by case basis, you know. Yep. Okay. Thank you. And I think Peter mansurin has got a question. Thanks. Uh, uh, it's along the same lines, but there's a school of thought that um, depending on the uh, crystalline structure, whether a, a fire. Uh, has occurred close to a particular item, and in particular to do with copper and all that, um, and to do with the oxygen concentration. Do, do, you, do you know anything about that? In other words, by looking at the uh, concentration of oxygen um, and the impact of it on the crystal structure. Are you saying that the concentration what, of, of, of oxygen in the actual copper itself, dissolved oxygen, yeah, well, yes, in the sense that there's a school of thought. There's a, a, a chap who, who's done a master's, I think, many years ago. Mm. And, uh, uh, he, he talks about this concentrate uh, uh, enrichment, I suppose, or mm. uh, the abundance of uh, uh, oxygen is identified. And therefore, from that point, they interpolate or extrapolate, depending how... Um, whether you agree with the theory or not, um, and say, oh, this must have occurred at the early stages of the this element of or material was at the heart of the fire or whatever at the very early mm -hmm. stages of it. I therefore, uh, it, it would have been the possible ignition area mm -hmm. causation, one of those sort of getting close to the area of uh, ignition. Mm. You guys have that sort of. I was involved in a case few, quite a few years ago, and there was two opposite views on this. Yeah. Uh, one from a university professor, and one from somebody else. And uh, unfortunately, the the case settled. And because the case settled, the let's say the theory continues. Mm. And I don't know if anybody's. Uh, you know, uh, unless something is tested in mm. a court of, uh, you know, in a courtroom, uh, mm. and somebody just comes up with any theory, mm. well, if it's not tested, they can still keep on peddling that idea. So mm. I was just interested in getting to the bottom of this. Mm. I've never been able to get to the bottom of it. Not um, whether you know anything about it. Uh, or your chaps I, th in your office. I, th I think all I can offer, uh, you're still going to try to get to the bottom of it. I'm, I'm sorry. The only thing I can say is. Look, I mean, the, the copper is um, is you know essentially you know, high purity. Um, so if you're talking oxygen, there's there's only two two forms that it can it can sort of be present. Either it's oxygen as a compound on on the surface, or oxygen which is in solution in the copper. And now whether whether um, 
whether the, the amount that would be in solution uh, is, is, is high, is, is, at a, is at a point that you can distinguish between uh, its state then and what it would have, what the copper was prior to, if it's very small amounts, you, you, you're struggling to, to, to pick any differences, I think. Um, so look, I, 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 I'm not, I couldn't tell you, I, I haven't come across that before. Um, but there's only, can, it, it can only exist in two forms, either in solution or as a, or as a, as a compound. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't have a, an I'll, answer. Um, continue along that, that uh, line of thinking. Okay, thank you. Were you gonna say something, Mark? Yeah, sorry. What I think what he uh, Peter was saying is uh, a, a guy, a metallurgist, came up with a theory that because in a fire there's oxygen depletion during a fire, that he could measure the oxide content of the copper and establish uh, when the melting occurred. So, if, like, yeah, based on that. And to be honest, I think it's uh, it's crap. By the way. <laughs> well, look, you know, for, for to have an oxide in the copper, right? That means it's a precipitate. Right, so that means you would have to have had excess copper to to have that oxide. I'm not sure if it's oxide. I'm not sure if it's oxide. It's just mix, uh, it was measure, measuring the oxygen in the melted metal based on. He made a theory that because it's in a fire and the fire has depleted the oxygen in the air, whatever the chemical reaction is, means that the metal would have a depletion of copper, and you could measure that the copper was depleted of oxygen and then that'll tell you when the melting occurred so if the arc occurred initially there'd be the standard or normal amount of oxygen or whatever the reaction was to the copper however if the melting happened during the fire there's a depletion of oxygen and therefore you should be able to measure that and then you can say that this was an arc or not thanks mark yeah. okay yeah look i mean um Look, every uh, every whether it's a steel or a copper, there's 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 oxygen uh, in the uh, in, in the melt, and there's oxygen in the in the, in, in solution. Now, um, but then it comes but then it comes down to also don't forget. Okay, I mean, unless you've got a, a tight a tight specification uh, on that on that copper, where you know you know whatever the grade may be. That uh, okay, this is 99% copper, and studies have shown that um, that copper typically has you know this parts per million of oxygen, and then you then once you've got the fire damage component, you do that analysis. Is the variation attributed to the incident, or is the variation just attributed to the fact that? based on how it was made previously, it just came in with a lower or higher oxygen content. Yeah, I'm pretty sure someone said, I'll give you three pieces of melting and you tell me which one was in the fire and the guy didn't want to do it. Yeah. Is there I a think, conclusion to that? I, I think problems? because you're talking such very small concentrations, um, and, and I guess, you know, the, the manufacturing of copper or steel castings or raw components, always there's always some variability in that, in that Compositional range, right? Uh, so depending on where it was sourced from, you know, whether it's local, whether it came from China or if it came from Brazil, you know, there's going to be subtle differences in that parts per million uh, concentration. So if you then do an analysis, something that's damaged uh, in a fire, and you get some sort of variation, how can you then pinpoint that to it being the fire or not, or whether it was due to how it was manufactured? In the first place, resulting in that lower or higher concentration. It's, um, I think it's difficult. Um, I think it's difficult. Beautiful. Any other questions from the floor for Roger? That sounds like crickets to me. Listen, I sorry, sorry. Uh, I've been looking for some time uh, to find a, a course on uh, material science. And it seems in Australia, most of the courses are to do with mining, and therefore they're not the physical metallurgy, as you mentioned before, they're the process metallurgy. 
Do you know of any course that is sort of, uh, let's say, uh, postgraduate sort of level uh, material science slash metallurgy? Um, Sorry for tuning in the spotlight. Yeah, look, we... Uh, oh, no, um, um, well, look, I don't, I don't know any that... Um, well, I'm not familiar with uh, courses given by uh, the university or that are short term. I know the TAFE don't do it, do it anymore. And unfortunately, material science and, and, and metallurgy is becoming a, a, a very sort of a niche, small market, um, which I don't know if that's a good thing or, or bad thing. I mean, it means we're all more in demand at the moment, but um, whether long-term that's sustainable, I don't know. But look, there are companies like ourselves and other uh, professional bodies like the uh, material science, uh, uh, the division of the material science society. They, they occasionally give uh, training courses throughout the year, but you have to keep a lookout for, uh, for when those dates are on. We've, we've done it uh, for companies, but when we've done it, it it's a case of having a, a group of, you know, uh, about six, 10 people. Uh, yeah, we don't sort of do one-on-one -on -one or anything like that. So, uh, unfortunately, um, there isn't uh, courses that are on every year or, or a set program. You just have to sort of keep an eye out, uh, say, for the Material Science Society and when they're giving it. Uh, and usually they might give a two-day, they might run a two-day forum. And, and, they, and they usually go for a uh, two-day forum, Material Science Society, that's for about, I don't know, 1500 bucks. Um, and, they'll, and, they'll, and then, you know, everyone just sort of, uh, they usually get a, you know, maybe a crowd of about 20 or so people. Um, and, and, and they'll deliver a two day course, two day forum. Uh, okay. yeah. Thank you. And, and there's also a similar question from Adrian. He says, are there any recommended references or sources for metallurgy failure studies? And he's saying only simple reading, please. Nothing too complicated. <laughs> <laughs> only simple. Fa fa uh, failure analysis studies, uh, a book yeah. called, a book by Wolpe, W-U-L-P-I, uh, I think failure analysis by Wolpe. W-U-L-P-I, I'm pretty sure. I can duck into the library and look for it. Has it come That's up? That's the author, is it? Yeah. Okay, I'll put that out over the chat anyway, so that hopefully if, will... If I've given you the wrong the wrong author, let me know and I can go into our library. We have a plethora of uh, failure analysis books and stuff like that and uh, I can find it. And Wolfie seems to be the one that a lot of us, a lot of the guys refer to. Uh, I guess, what is your email, Roger? And I'll just put it over the chat right now if anyone wants it. It's, uh, so it's Roger, R-O-G-E-R dot... Yep. Costanzi, C O S T A N Z I. Yep. At bureauveritas.com. B U R E A U V E R I T A S dot com. Yep. No A U. Mm. Okay, so I think I've put it out there. So if anyone wants to grab that, they can and email Roger directly if they are looking for that book. That could be for you, Adrian. Beautiful. Uh, any other questions or comments from for Roger? I know Paul's there, but on the bit, you want to say something, Paul? You always got something to say. Oh, he's on the sh he's silent. That's a first. There you go. Well, listen, I think we'll wrap it up. Uh, despite the uh, the false start, uh, we got there in the end. Thank you, Roger, for your patience, and uh, we got there. Uh, Grant's also put up a link to some article for everyone to have a look at. I don't know what that is, what type of article that is. If I it, click on that. It may be related. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, whoopee. There it is. Yes. Uh, Journal of a Failure Analysis and Prevention. There you go. Not sure he's the same with gentleman or not. Yeah, if it's whoopee, yeah, that's him. Okay. There you go. Thank you very and, much. Uh, Ray you very has much got for... something there. No worries, Grant. But yes, thanks again to uh, Roger and thank you, Sonia, also for finding Roger. Uh, we're always looking for uh, different topics on uh, fire investigation for not only our association, but the uh, other associations around Australia and New Zealand. So this is definitely something that uh, 
we come across, we see these metal things happening and burning and melting and charring and sooting and uh, discolouring. And a lot of it I look at and go, wow, all I know is, is what I can see. I don't know much more beyond that. So tonight it was good to, uh, to actually see something behind uh, actual failure of, uh, of a metal, metal being uh, after a fire. So that was, that was great. Uh, I'd like to thank you again. Uh, we're looking to have uh, another education night in April. Uh, we'll give you some more details on that first weekend in April, but we're aiming to do again uh, six education nights this year, uh, every second month on the first Thursday. If there uh, are... Don't Sorry? to ask everybody for other ideas, please. Yeah, certainly. If you've got some ideas on uh, what you think would be an interesting topic, send it to myself or Bob or Mark Pellegrino, who is our education officer, and uh, we will uh, gl gladly uh, like to see some different uh, ideas. Someone's phone's ringing. Sweeney. Had to be Sweeney. Right, oh, well, thanks a lot, everyone, and thanks, uh, stay safe out there. And, Roger, thank you very much for your time. No, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Roger. Yeah, thanks to Sonia Roger. as well, and uh, looking forward to catching up down the track. Thank Thanks, you. Roger. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Bye-bye. Michael as well. Yes, no worries. Thank you. I'll stop the recording.